Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, Go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Even if your passive income stream is nothing to do with your main business, because it doesn't have to be, it could be something completely different, uh, you still need to know your ideal client for it as much as you do for your main business. It's the most important bit. You need to understand everything about them. When you know that, instead of thinking, do I want to do a course? Do I want to do a membership? Instead of thinking that, think, who do I want to serve? Who do I want to help? Start with that, because if you grow an audience of those people, they will tell you what they need anyway. Welcome back. I hope your week's been awesome so far. Now, if you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Yaro Starak of Inbox Done and Blog Mastermind, and with Steve Brown, author of The Golden Toilet, then do go check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Lisa Johnson, who's a seven-figure business coach specializing in in helping entrepreneurs scale their businesses using passive income from memberships and courses. After a tough childhood spent in social housing, Lisa went on to have successful careers in law, in banking and the entertainment industry. Her background in overcoming obstacles has helped mould her into a bold, straight-talking coach who is never afraid to be an authentic and outspoken truth-teller. She's spoken on the BBC's Women's Hour and is a Thrive Global contributor. She's been featured in national newspapers and magazines, including Psychologies, The Guardian and Forbes. Lisa lives in the UK and coaches and travels all around the globe. In our discussion today, Lisa talked to me about how getting really clear about her dream customer totally transformed her business. She explained how she transitioned her business to be focused on leveraged income. And she explained to me the differences between courses, memberships, and group programs. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Lisa Johnson. Hi. I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Stephen Age. I think that's the right pronunciation. <laughs> Stephen Age. In, Stephen Age in the UK. There we go. Lisa Johnson, who's a freedom and success coach specializing in passive income, in strategy, and in mindset. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Lisa. It's a real wow. privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Natasha Vorompiova, who was our guest on episode 311 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you on the show. So hello to Natasha. Oh, I love Natasha. She's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Now, it's fascinating. You started off in office work and then you went on to get a law degree. Then you ended up doing wedding planning and now you're a business coach mainly working in online with memberships and with courses. So what what made you kind of change direction and particularly how did you discover coaching and that that was kind of something you were really passionate about? It's a long old story. I think that with me, what I seem to have done throughout my whole life is um, just rewrite my story a lot. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I grew up in council housing, in in 
in England where there was poverty. It wasn't a great start. Um, but as I grew up, as I grew older, I realized that I wanted more than that. And nobody around me was kind of ambitious. You know, I, there was no role models for me to look at to say, okay, this is where I want to go. I didn't know a single person that owned their business or, or worked in an office. It was, you know, carers and, and people that didn't have any money. And so I grew up with that and, and I got a scholarship to a private school and actually got bullied at that school for being poor because they had lots of money. And it kind of started my thinking in, even when I was really young, in there must be ways to make money and to get out of these situations. Like it can't be like this forever. And so when I was, I left school when I was 16 with no qualifications and decided I was just going to get office work. Like that was going to be the first thing that I was going to do. And I did okay with that. Um, you know, I was working for something ridiculous, like 35 pounds a week or something, but uh, you know, it was a, a job and that's what I wanted. I wanted to learn and kind of like clawed my way up really, um, doing things like PA jobs and office junior jobs. And then realized that I was never going to get further than that if I didn't get more educated because I just left school with nothing. And so gave myself the task of doing a law degree. And this law degree, I knew I couldn't do full time. I didn't have any money. I was living on my own. And so I said, what I would do is I will do a distance learning law degree where every September they send you all the books. And then every May you go and take the exams. And you do all of the rest on your own. So for four years, I kind of left my PA job, got my books and was studying in my bedroom. Didn't go to the pub, didn't have fun with friends. I was just like, we, I had a proper tunnel vision on what I wanted to achieve. And after four years, I got my law degree. I was one point away from a first in my law degree. So I was like, okay, this means I can rewrite everything now. And so I did. I rewrote my whole story. I then decided I didn't want to be in law. Climbed the law ladder. I didn't want to be in law. Went into investment banking. Um, and did that for a bit. I was a TV presenter for a while and an actress. I was really trying all the things to see which was the thing that felt good to me. And none of them really did. Um, the, the one that I felt most comfortable in was uh, in investment banking. I was there throughout the 2008 crash and I was a risk analyst at that time. So that was really interesting to see you know, what was happening to businesses. But it got me thinking about businesses because I was seeing what businesses were thriving and what businesses just were, were dying during that period and trying to work out as a risk analyst why. Why were some of them doing really well and some of them weren't? And that was my first kind of taste of people have businesses, people make their own business, you always have to work for somebody else. But I wasn't in a position to do anything about it right then. And then I accidentally got pregnant with twins. Um, and so I had to rewrite my entire life all over again. I had this uh, thing in my head where I was going to be climbing a ladder in the investment banking world, making lots of money in that world. And I didn't make it because I got pregnant with twins. And so at first I was that person that thought I could just go back to work and everything would be fine. They would just somehow fit into my life. But as anyone with kids knows, that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. And so I went back to work when they were five months old, single parent at that time going through a divorce. And realized that there was no way that I was going to be able to do it. I was leaving my house at six o'clock in the morning while they were in bed. I was getting home at about 10 p.m. They were in bed. Mm. And I was just never seeing them. And so I, I thought, what am I going to do? I was earning a kind of decent wage. I thought the only thing I can do is go back to being a PA, go and get a nine to five job near my house so that I can see them before and after work and make them your priority. So that's what I did. And, and I went from earning a, a 60000 pound salary to a 15,000 pound, 20,000 pound salary and tried to make that work. And I got bored very quickly. So I was now a PA playing on the internet most of the day and thinking there must be something else that I can do. And then I remembered about the people that had businesses. I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a business on the side. I'm going to be productive with the time that I have. And didn't really know what to start a business in, didn't have any real skills at that point. And so I chose wedding planning because it seemed fun and glamorous. And it's not, by the way. It seemed it, though, <laughs> from the outside. And so I started this wedding planning business on the side. And in the first year, I got 13 full planning weddings, which is really good. But I didn't know anything about business. 
And so I was making every mistake that you can make. And at the end of the year, I had a new boyfriend and we sat down and he said, well, let's see how much you're making from it. See if you can leave your nine to five job. I was making one pound 15 an hour. I was never going to be leaving that nine to five job. And so at this point, I was £30,000 in debt because of me having to leave my great job and go to a different job and suddenly having twins to feed. And so I was like, well, I have a choice here. I either just stick to what I'm doing. Just know that you're going to do this nine to five PA job forever. You're always going to be in debt and you're going to be able to see your kids. Or decide that now you need to rewrite your story properly, put some money into this, get a coach, and I just heard about business coaches and learn what you can about business. If you've already £30,000 in debt, £35,000 in debt doesn't make that much difference in your own mind. And so that's what I did and got a credit card um, and got this business coach. And she taught me all the basics I should have known already, you know, how to do an actual marketing plan, social media strategy, ideal clients, money mindset, all the stuff I didn't know. And it changed everything for me, especially the ideal client piece. And within five months, I got my first ideal client. And she worked for Google. Her husband worked for Facebook. They had a really big budget for their wedding. And three months later, I was fully booked for about one and a half years with high, high budget, great ideal clients. And it turned the business around. And we became the biggest urban wedding planning business in the UK in that time. Carried on doing that, happy as Larry, for a couple of years and then realized that actually the life that I wanted meant I couldn't have it. I wanted to travel. I'd never traveled anywhere. And I saw this big globe and I wanted to travel and I wanted to show the kids the world. And I wanted to spend time with them at weekends. And I'd given myself a career where I worked throughout the entire summer every single weekend. Weekend, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, this isn't really working for me. Um, but people had been asking me for two or three years, you know, how have you done this? How have you made this work for you? Um, and you've been able to pay off some of your debt. And so I started teaching them the bits that I'd read. And by this time, I was a self-development junkie. I was reading all the books and I was doing all the courses. And so I started teaching them what I had done. And they started making more money. And then more people were coming to me. And so three and a half years ago, I said, you know what? I like doing this. I like teaching these people. I'm going to become a business coach. And I started Lisa Johnson Coaching. I tried to sell the business. We had lots of interested parties. but this business by now, Carmela Weddings, it was my baby. You know, I'd grown this. It was mm. a big thing. And all the people wanted to know was how much money can I make from it? They didn't care about wedding planning or brides. And, and I cared so much about them. And so I decided instead of selling it to do a competition. And I did a competition for people that financially couldn't afford to start a wedding planning business, but they loved wedding planning and always had. And we found the perfect person and I gave it away. So, you know, there were five years ahead of where they would have been with a portfolio and SEO and all that kind of stuff. And she's doing really well with it now and started Lisa Johnson Coaching. And this time I knew about business. I'd read everything. So within the first six months, I, I made 100000 in profit. Within the first year, I made 220000 It was all going really well from the outside. But what I'd actually done is put myself back in the same position of working from six o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. Um, and not seeing my kids again. And so it was like something needs to change. And that's when I found out about passive income and, and that whole world. And it changed everything for me. Hmm. Yeah, it's a fascinating journey. And and one of the things that I, I certainly perked up there where I was listening to you, because it's something that I'm really passionate about and we do a lot of work with our clients in and it's really getting clear about who your ideal client is and and what drives them and what motivates them and what their pain points are and needs yeah. and so on. So I, I was really interested to hear that yeah. that was the, it was the, the big thing that, that turned your business around in the yeah. early days. It really was. And the other thing, hmm, the other thing that I really liked, uh, you, you kind of played on it a little bit when you got to selling the business and that was around, you know, that you care for the customer. So whilst, whilst your coaching is a little bit about how do I make money and how do I, do what Lisa did in terms of, you know, getting rid of debt really quickly and being successful in terms of earning money. So I think that caring for the customer is also another big key there. It's been a massive difference. That has been 
where my biz biggest successes have been because really early on in the coaching industry, I had coaches that didn't have a great deal of integrity. Now, I was really new. I wasn't doing my due diligence properly. I was just going with people that I thought could help me. And I could see the inauthenticity of it all and the bro marketing side and then the female bro marketing side because there's no real difference. And, you know, there was so much out there which I didn't want to be. And it taught me very quickly. It was a great lesson because it taught me very quickly who I did want to be in coaching and what was important to me. And my biggest... Um, my biggest values are integrity, transparency, and honesty. And those, I've always lived that in my coaching. And that's what's got me where I am. When people refer me, they refer me with, without, you know, incentive because of the integrity piece, because I actually give a crap about hmm. the results. And I know people tell you all the time, you shouldn't care about the results. You know, you should disassociate yourself from the results. I believe that's dangerous. I think you should really care about the results because if you care about the results, you're going to do everything you can to get your client those results. And that's important. You should do that because especially with the passive income side, and we can go on to that, you'll die a death in passive income if your clients don't absolutely love you and shout about their results with you. Um, hmm. so yeah, yeah, I love that. It's, I always find it fascinating that um, particularly in the marketing game that people um, do their marketing and say, okay, we've, we've made the sale, it's done, it's finished, it's that over. Is. Where it, that's, that's where it really actually starts and it's exactly what you said. It's, um, you know, I'm not here to sell you something, I'm here to help you get the result that you want to achieve. Yeah. The reason you came to me in the first place was to solve a problem and get a result by solving that problem and that's what I'm committed to. So, yeah. you know, and, and if, if you out care. You're passionate about mm. that and, and I think people that go into coaching are. If you're passionate about that, profit follows passion. So you don't need to think about the money side because it will come anyway. Mm. All right, well talk to us a little bit about, I mean, passive income. First of all, passive income, there's no such thing as no, passive income because you, you know, clearly you did a lot of work oh, yeah. to set up these systems that then generate an income without you actually selling time for money. I think that's the that's it, key yeah. thing because you mentioned you mentioned working sort of 6 a.m. to yeah, 10 yeah. p.m. and that wasn't sustainable for you. You didn't have time for your kids and and to travel and do the other things you want to do. So tell us about how you transferred mm. the, you know, what, what did you do actually to transfer to a, um, not time for money. Yeah, which is what, let's be honest about it. Let's get rid of the myth of passive income. It isn't passive and we shouldn't even really call it passive. It's just that that's what it's become known as. And I really mm. wish it has become, would become known as leveraged income. But whenever mm. I say, oh, I help people make leveraged income, people are like, I have no idea what that is. Um, so we still call it passive. But in reality, it is just leveraging your time and leveraging your skills and knowledge. So what happened with me is during that time when I was like, I actually forgot to pick my kids up from school because I was so busy one day that I, it was their first week at a new school and I forgot to pick them up because I was with one to one clients all day and it was a wake up call. And I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. And I was listening to a podcast and somebody was talking about passive income and they were arguing about whether it was real or not. And anything like that piques my interest. So I'm like, Ooh, let's have a listen to this. And I was listening and I was thinking, if this is real, this is going to help me transition my business to where I want it to be. And I went down this rabbit hole of looking at all these different kinds of passive income streams and, you know, listening to every single thing that Pat Flynn had done and all of these other marketers that were about passive income. And I realized that if I could learn all of this stuff, it could work. And I actually spent over a hundred thousand pounds learning everything. I did every course out there on passive income. And slowly, over a period of about six to eight months, started implementing what I was learning. So I'd add one passive income stream, the bits that didn't work, I would get rid of. I would write down everything that had worked. And then I'd add another, and then I'd add another. Within a year, so if we think of like year two of my business, my, my coaching business, I was working 60 or 70 hours a week at that point and I was making 220,000 which I realize isn't bad but it still hits an income ceiling within one year I was earning over a million a year and I was working 30 hours a month it just changed everything and so 
I started kind of working out which were the easiest ones to do then, like rather than trying all the drop shipping and the ones that I felt were harder, like affiliate marketing, what, what's easier? And I started looking at courses, memberships, group programs, things that were more semi-passive than passive. So you were still doing some work. And that's where the sweet spot was. And so then I started teaching other people how to do that. And they started getting, you know, less burnt out and having time to spend doing the things they really wanted to do. And it just became my absolute passion and still is. And, you know, we were just talking before we came on air that it's now got to a point where I'm in year three of my business, just over it. And yesterday I made a million pounds in 24 hours in semi-passive income. And so for me, it's such a scalable way of doing things, that transition to passive. And, and there's all these reasons why people don't do it. Like, well, surely I have to do one-to-one for 10 years first and become established. And it's actually just a business model. It's just a, a choice of business model that you want to have. And I think people don't even know half the time that the choice is there. I didn't. I thought I had to do one-to-one. So that's what I did. Yeah. All right. Well, you mentioned a couple of, or three things there, actually, in terms of that I think are quite different models, um, but you, you do them all. So talk to us a little bit about the difference between, say, courses and membership and a group coaching program. Cool. Yeah, we'll do. So that, so, so here's how I started with courses. I thought, let's go passive. I'll write a course. Because what I found was that people were asking me the same things in the one-to-ones. And people were doing that whole, can I pick your brains thing. And if anyone says, can I pick your brains, that means, can you write me a course? So I decided to put together this course, which I did. And I, it was 10 modules. And I packaged it up and I put it on my website. And people were buying it from my website. And from my, it wasn't actually a website. It was, it was my Facebook group that they were buying it from. And I had a, a kind of sales page rather than a website. Because at that point, I didn't even have a website. And people were buying it. And I'd wake up in the morning with more money in my bank account. I'd go, this is, this is what I mean. This is great. And pe- but people would be going away and just doing it with no input from me. But then I started getting disillusioned and, and thinking, if I'm about integrity... How can I let them go away knowing in reality that most people that do courses don't ever complete or even open the course? And so I started feeling bad about that. So I thought, okay, what if I delivered it live once a month? I'll deliver one of the modules live over a 10-month period. I still only have to do 10 hours work. It's already written. The workbooks are there. All I have to do is deliver it. So I started doing that because if I show up, they're more likely to show up. and There's some accountability Mm. and they can ask questions. So what that gave me was a semi-passive income stream instead of a passive one. But actually, people started getting all the results from it and shouting about it. So it it made things even better for me. So rather than if somebody came to me and wanted one-to-one work, I might be able to charge them around 20,000. But with this course, I could have lots of people on it. And so for doing the same amount of hours, 10 hours work, I can make 300,000. So I was leveraging that time. So courses were like my favorite thing. And then I started realizing that people, some people wanted more like group programs where it's not just me. There's more coaching rather than teaching. Other people are involved in it as well. And we meet in person and longer periods of time. And so I started doing that, but realized that if I was giving more of my time, I was having to charge, I was going to charge more because my time is the one thing that's precious. So you know, a group program is going to cost more than a course where you only get me for an hour. And then I realized that even then, people still couldn't afford all of these things. And there were people coming to me that needed help with their businesses and they couldn't afford me. And there's two problems with that. One, the integrity piece again. And two, I'm leaving money on the table. And so that's why I started a membership. And with the membership, I could be very passive with it. So I started a membership for female entrepreneurs called the Get Shit Done Society. And in it, I would have somebody coming in once a month to train them on one thing. Could be Instagram stories, could be mindset, something that they needed in their business. And I would just come in for half an hour every Friday evening because what I wanted to replicate is what I was missing in my corporate world, which is after work drinks, where we'd all get together. And so I started this thing called Wine Down Friday, where we'd all get together with a glass of wine on Facebook and we'd have a chat. 
and would see how the week's gone and I would tell them the things that I'd learned in my business for half an hour. And it went really well. And so I was only spending two hours a month in the membership, but it was making me three, four hundred thousand a year. And with, you know, I suddenly had this business model that started with a membership. There was then step ups to courses, step up to group programs. And then if they really wanted to work with me, they could apply for one to one, but it was going to be a lot more money. And I would only do it during one day. I would never do anything over three months. And that business model very quickly made me a million um, a year. And it's so scalable because you can have more people on it. That's, that's how I just made the million in 24 hours. I didn't do anything different. I just had more people on the same course. And so, yeah. you, yes, yeah. you have to put more provisions in, like more coaches in there and accountability pods and things to make sure people still get the end result if there's more people in there. But actually, it's worth it. Hmm. So do you have a team of coaches or do you bring specific experts in that you partner with? It depends what I do. So in my membership, I have a team of six coaches that are good at different things. So I have like a health coach because we realized that actually that was really important and that we were missing that. We were teaching them all the strategy and they were all like getting burnt out. So we have a health coach in there. We have a Facebook ads person. We have a tech coach. All the things that I found difficult when I started, I've put in there. Hmm. Um, and that really helps because they're hands off and they can just do what they need to do and teach per week and per month. With guest experts, I just bring them in as and when. So if I can see that, you know, someone needs help with growing their Facebook group, I'll go find the right person and offer them to come in to speak. And I've capped my membership at the moment at 500 people. So I never have to launch it, just wait list bring people in on the wait list when people leave. Um, and I don't let people back in, which every, every coach told me was a really bad thing to do. But I was like, you know what? I'm doing it my way. Um, people aren't mm. going back in. It makes people not leave as well. There's good retention there. Um, so, yeah, I, have, I use people for different things. You know, I have friends in masterminds that I'm in that I think, you know what? You'd be great for the membership or you'd be great for my coaching program. And then I have also people, a team of two or three coaches in my main courses or group programs that are there all the time employed by me. So, yeah, there's different ways mm -hmm. of doing things. But up until January, I had none of this. So I was making seven figures, but I didn't have a single person on my team. It was still just me and I'd never used Facebook ads. And I realized this year that if I really want to scale, I need to change that and I need to get a team in place. Now I have a team of six people and, you know, I need to employ coaches and I need to use Facebook ads. And it's been a real learning curve because I do feel you sort of wing being a business owner for the first couple of years. And then you suddenly realize you do have a fully fledged business and you need to take care of it um, and do all the things you need to do to stay making it passive or semi-passive. All right. So the um, one, one thing I'm curious about, in the early days, how did you grow the um, that ideal client base? How did you grow the community of people that discovered you and yeah. said, that sounds interesting, I mean, I'll try this out? Yeah, so all I did, there was no strategy in this when I first started. <laughs> all I did was I started a Facebook group. Uh, for people that were in creative industries because I'd come from the wedding industry, so it made sense. And every single day I went into that Facebook group live and I talked about some of the things that I'd learned in my business, in my wedding business, and some of the things I found difficult. And I took them on a journey with me of starting my coaching business and said, you know, this is what I did in my coaching business today. I'm starting to look at branding. And, and I just took them with me and taught them the things that were happening to me. And that when you, when you do that, I really believe you have to be really honest about the things that don't work as well as do. So, you know, I lost a lot of money in the first year of my coaching business by not doing due diligence on coaches and things like that. And I would talk to them about what I wish I'd have done differently so that they could learn from it. And this created huge trust because I wasn't just showing people this shiny business. You know, I was telling the truth about it all. And after five months, I had an audience of 1,200 people that had started to follow, I was using a funnel. So I was not with ads, but I, was, I had a freebie that if I spoke to people in different groups, I would give out the freebie at the end, like training people. And that would get people coming into the group and then they would tell others about the group. 
Um, by five months, I had 1,200 people. In month six was the first time I sold. I didn't sell anything for the first five months of the coaching business uh, when I started to make it passive. In month six, I sold two things and made 100,000 because they were ready to buy by then. So it worked really well. I still have Facebook groups now. That's still the way, the main way that I sell things. So basically, you, you, in that initial time, you spent six months building relationships with people, giving them stuff that was helpful, yeah. sharing information that was uh, both, here's how, here's yeah. what worked, here's what was successful, but here's what I wish I'd done differently yeah. and here's the, here's the mistake I made and what I learned. Yeah, because I don't believe in this... You know, people kept telling me all the time I was having these coaches and they were saying just give the what and the why don't give the how because that's what they're going to need to pay you for eventually and I was like nah I'm going to give the how because if I give the how in reality I still give the how now like when I do challenges and launches I tell them exactly what to do I don't I don't keep anything back because I believe that people don't buy programs for the knowledge I think they buy it for the step-by-step hand-holding with the knowledge and for the support and for the accountability and all of the yeah. things that come with that. And so I still give all of the how. And it didn't, it hasn't hurt me one bit, giving the how. Mm. Yeah, well, clearly, um, financially, you're still quite successful. I, I always say that um, what people are looking for in those things is the access and the accountability. That's, that's what differentiates the kind of the lead magnet or the freebie that right. you might give away from when they pay. So they actually pay for access and accountability. Most people don't understand that. And, and even when I go into a program, it's, you know, I realize at some point, oh, it's unconscious that that's actually what, what you're wanting. Yeah. And that's why when you sell something, people don't really care. It took me a while to realize this. People don't care what they're getting. So I'd sell something and I'd be telling them about the modules. I'm going to be there three times a week and I'm going to give you this and this and this coach. They don't care. They only care about will this solve my problem? Exactly. That's yeah. it. <laughs> so if you can demonstrate that it will, they will buy. Hmm. And it comes back to what you said earlier, what sort of turned things around for you in the first instance, which was understanding who the ideal customer is and understanding what their problem is. So if you're talking to the right person and you're talking to them about their their problem or challenges or issues and uh, those people say, oh, yeah, that's exactly what, what I need. Yeah. I need to get this challenge result. I need to get this result. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and you have to do that at the right time as well. So like I've been banging on about passive income for two years. Now, as you can imagine, people are like, oh, yeah, I need a passive income stream. I really shouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. Like, I should diversify until this year when everyone's gone, oh, crap. Now I, now I get it. Now I need it. And so n this year was the year that I knew I could do this big. And, and it worked because I could talk about the real pain points that people are feeling right now out there with pandemics stopping businesses and that kind of thing. Um, you know, that's what people need right now. And so sometimes what I see, especially with some of my clients, is they're trying to sell something they want to sell to their ideal client. But they're not listening to what their ideal client is saying they want to buy. And it's two different things. You have to listen to what the people want to buy. You might want to sell something. But if people don't want it, you, you're flogging a dead horse. Instead, listen and then create something that they've already told you they will buy from you. Mm. Yes, that's uh, really good advice. And um, sometimes we all fall into the trap of, I've got this great idea, wouldn't it be wonderful? And, and then you, it's very, very um, tempting to get into the situation of pushing the idea out to people and saying, you really need this. And yet, yeah. you know, they're, they're telling you, no, I don't, I need something else. Yeah, I've got, I've got other, things, <laughs> other things that are actually on my mind, front of mind right now. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Now, um, do you, you mentioned that you've got a membership group that's limited to 500. So that, is that membership group ongoing? And also with the courses, are they kind of evergreen or do you have launches and bring in new and different topics? Yeah. So with the the membership, it's ongoing. So it's been going for three years. And um, people are in there mainly for the 
community. Like I have realized this. I can bring in the best experts in the world. They will care less about it than being there with other people that understand what they're trying to achieve. They want to be around people like them. And that's usually because the people that come into my membership have, have been in business maybe one, two years. They're not, they're not very established yet. And I think that there's a real big shift that happens when you start your own business, which your friends don't understand, your families don't really understand. You're working all the time at the beginning. We all did. Um, and they need other people around them to be able to talk about those things with. And so even though I bring in guest experts, the membership, it's about the community. And that's what keeps it running for like people in there for three years because you get to know other people and with the courses it's much more about you are at a and you want to be at b and i will take you through the steps to get from a to b and then you will leave so they don't they're not ongoing i don't have any of them ongoing and, and i think that courses that are ongoing can be a bit tricky because you know you want to get your clients to the point where you baby bird syndrome, you push them out of the nest, then they have to start doing it. You don't want to get codependent clients. Um, and so I always end my courses. I don't have anything. Yeah, on. What, what I meant by ongoing with courses, I mean, that makes Be sense. Like evergreen. Evergreen, yeah. So yeah. That it's always there. So people can come in at any time and start a day. I don't do any and, of that. No. Okay. So all of mine are launched based, open, closed cart, launch based. Apart from my tripwire, my tripwire makes us, I never had, I told people about having a tripwire for so long um, on a self-liquidating funnel. I never did it myself. I was teaching everyone to do it. And then this year we were like, do you know what? We really should start doing this. And I <laughs> added one in and it makes us like £2,000 a month um, self-liquidating for our Facebook ad spend so that we don't have to pay for Facebook ad spend. Um which is great, but that's the only thing I have on Evergreen that people can just buy all the time. All of my other courses are stop start. I only have two programs and I just hmm. stop. So when you say self-liquidating, so that's a, a one-off kind of program that people buy off the Facebook advertising. They buy it. It's probably a small investment and that gets them from A to B in in the little kind of thing. Yeah. But it, it also puts them into your community so that you keep talking to them about exactly. forthcoming launches yeah and we know that you know people that buy from you once the, the percentage of people mm. that buy from you are much more likely to come from people that have bought from you once so it's a really good idea to do it i have it on the thank you page so i don't have it at the start of the funnel i have freebies like quizzes and things like that at the start of the funnel and then on the thank you page i'll add the tripwire which is like 49 pounds it's a two-part course. It's tiny about creating communities. And, you know, they buy that, they do that, and then they're in my world anyway. So they're much more likely to buy from me again. Mm. Yeah, th those things work really well. So love it. Okay, and, and so most of your work is actually teaching what you're doing. Yeah, your all of it. Or, or, or what I did. If it's not teaching what I'm doing, it's what I did. So I have a yeah. course called Fabulous Foundations, and that's me teaching all that stuff from the wedding business side. So it's not for wedding business owners anymore because I've realized that it's the same in business. Whatever you're doing, you still need that foundation, that basics that I wish somebody had taught me before I started my business. And so I've put that into a course, and I still teach that now. Now, most of my audience now probably about 70% want the passive stuff. That's where they are. They're already doing okay. They just want to want to add in recurring revenue. Um, but there are still some people that come to me that want the beginnings bit. And so I have those two courses for the two different types of clients. Um, and that works well. But you're right in that I generally teach people what I do. So one of the things that I realized was when I was you know, starting, I was doing my business. I kept adding in these passive income streams and I added in different ones, not just courses. I added in, I have a jewelry range, you know, that's completely passive. I have a candle range that's completely passive. So I was trying, I was doing the drop shipping. I was playing with that. I have affiliate marketing. So I do a lot of affiliate kind of stuff. Um, I have stocks and bonds. I have a property company now. So I was playing with all of these things. But the ones that I teach are the ones that I believe everyone can do. And that's why I teach the memberships and the, and the courses in the main in a program, my one-to-many program. But I realized that when I was doing this and when I was teaching my clients to do it on a one-to-one -one basis, 
I was teaching them the same thing over and over again. I I'd had a system and I didn't even know I had a system. I was doing it all the time. And so I then ended up writing the system and I trademarked it. And basically my course is teaching them that system, which I call the cash system. Yeah. Okay. And cash stands for? C stands for client. So we just talked about ideal client mm. and how it's really important that even if your passive income stream is nothing to do with your main business, because it doesn't have to be, it could be something completely different. Uh, you still need to know your ideal client for it as much as you do for your main business. It's the most important bit. You need to understand everything about them. When you know that, instead of thinking, do I want to do a course? Do I want to do a membership? Instead of thinking that, think, who do I want to serve? Who do I want to help? Start with that. Because if you grow an audience of those people, they will tell you what they need anyway. So that comes onto the A. You grow an audience using a funnel and you put them somewhere where you can nurture them. So that could be a Facebook group, or it could be Instagram, or it could be an email list, or it could be all of these things. But you need to nurture them. You can't just grow a Facebook group or grow a group of, of clients, potential clients, and do nothing with them. They need to trust you. Um, and then the first S, because there's two S's in the cash system, which doesn't make <laughs> me happy, but it's there. Um, the first S is structures and systems. So people used to say, the tech is hard. I don't want to do it because the tech, that was always the problem. But the tech has become easier. People are putting these systems out there, which are pretty much drag and drop when it comes to teachable, thinkific. Kajabi, Kartra, there's so many different systems. So it's about which systems to use and playing with those systems and also the structure of how you're going to do something. So let's say you are going to do a course. It's about how you're going to do it. For me, I love video. I'm always going to do things on video. Uh, some people like workbooks. Some people like audio. Some people want to do an email course. It's what works for you and your ideal client. And so it's playing around with that and working out the content of what you're going to put in, whether that's a membership, an ebook whatever you're going to do that's semi-passive. The next S is the most important one. That's selling. In other words, if we're talking about passive, that's launching. Launching is a strategy on its own. It's a six to 12 week process. And I can't tell you the number of people that come to me and say, but I wrote a course. And I put it out there to my audience, which I grew and they didn't buy it. So it must be a really rubbish course. And I'll say, how did you launch it? Well, I just told them about it. How? in a post. <laughs> I'm like, that's not launching anymore. Our, our clients are really savvy. Our online audiences have been burned before. They've done courses that haven't worked. They've done courses they haven't even started. You know, they're really savvy. They're smart and they should be. And so we have to be giving them what they need and showing them what it could be like and showing them how we teach and showing them that they are ready for this. And that can be done in so many different ways, summits, festivals, challenges, webinars, and it's choosing the right thing for you. So having an actual mapped out launch plan is the thing that most people don't have and it's the thing that they need. And then the H is about keeping clients happy because like we discussed, the first time you're doing a passive income stream, whether it's a course or a membership or anything, you're probably going to write it as you go along. In fact, do write it as you go along. Never spend six months writing the damn thing and then people yeah. might not buy sell it. it. First. Yeah. Yes, exactly. sell it first. Mm. Um, and so if you're going to do that, it's the, as far away from passive as you can imagine the first time you write a course and grow an audience. So what you want to make sure is that you have the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time doing the same course because then you've done all the marketing that you can reuse. You've done the, the way you're going to launch that you can reuse. You have all the PowerPoint presentations that you're going to reuse. You've got the workbooks which you're going to reuse. That's when it becomes passive. But you won't get there if your clients originally aren't happy because the way that it works is you can only sell something based on other people's testimonials. And if you don't want to pay for ads, you need those people to be shouting about you everywhere. They're only going to do that if you get the results. So in, in my course, One to Many, at the beginning, we saw that people were stopping on like, they weren't getting past modules two and three. Some were, but some were. So we'd go back to them and say, what, what's wrong? Like, why are you not doing the work? And they'd say, because the tech's hard and you're, te you're teaching us how to make a sales funnel, but we're actually finding it really difficult. So what do we do? We give them a sales funnel. So now in, in our program, we give people the entire sales funnel done for you because if it's going to get them to the end, it's worth it. But even then, people on module eight were getting stuck. And we were like, why are people not getting to the end? We've given them all this stuff. And we asked them. Oh, you know, life gets in the way. It's hard to keep motivated because 
you know, passive income is not a get rich quick scheme. It's going to take you some time and effort. So people are like, yeah, I'm finding it really hard to do. So we added in accountability pods so that they would have to get to the end mm. um, and make the money. And now we get more results than we've, we've ever got. But that's because we're keeping the client happy and that's what it's about. But if you do those five steps, C-A-S-S-H, you will always make money from passive or semi-passive income. But it, mm. it's getting to that stage. Most people give up at the first hurdle, which is growing an audience. Mm. Yeah, and I love love that. It's a complete system, so it's not it's not done until the client's got the result and you've got so many different ways to kind of help the client get the result and monitoring that, seeing what's happening. That's uh, yeah. that's the I think that's a difference between good courses and bad courses. I mean I've done some good courses, some really good courses in terms of the content that they provide. They've been stunning in content but they don't have a lot of that you know there's no connection with the community yeah. there's no support when you get stuck there's no um or little support let's say there's no um accountability so as you say life gets in the way hey i was too busy today so and then once once you drop behind three or four um sessions yeah. it's kind of like oh i'm overwhelmed because you look at what do i have to do now oh there's there's tons of things I have to do. And so you just. Yeah, and this yeah. is what happened to me. So, when I first started, the first course I bought was a course about making courses. Because I was like, okay, I want to make passive income. I need to make a course. So, I did that and I made the course. It was a good course, but I made the course and I was like, well, now what? I don't have an audience. Who am I going to sell it to? So, I bought another course on how to build an audience. And then I bought another course on how to nurture that audience to monetize. And then I bought another course on how to launch because I realized once I had an audience, I had no idea how to launch something. And then I bought another course on retention. And I was like, this is ridiculous. So that's why I made one to many so that it was right from the beginning all the way to the end. Because it just mm. it felt like there was a lot of people giving you a little part of the solution and mm. then wanting to sell you another part. And I didn't want to do that. Mm. All right. So you talked a little bit about launching and, and that's one thing that a lot of um, people don't get right or don't spend enough time on and you also somewhere i don't know you may have been in the information you sent me said that launching has changed quite dramatically over the past few years so how how has it changed yeah i think that how we used to launch i mean if we're honest about it five years ago as long as you put some money into facebook you could pretty much double that mm. it was like a, a machine it was just automation at its finest that doesn't work anymore it doesn't work in the same ways and that's not because the automation doesn't work it's because our clients have become cleverer and they've seen it all before. This isn't new anymore. This isn't like a, a fancy thing that they see on Facebook. They know exactly what you're doing when you have a Facebook group. They know you're going to sell to them now. They know if you say the word webinar, you're going to sell to them. And so you have to make things more interesting for clients. The same old thing won't work. And I've seen a real shift in that. One of the things that I've really noticed is people that used to sell using salespeople, it doesn't work as much anymore. People want to speak or at least have some access when they're buying to the person that will be teaching them. And so those huge companies, I've seen them go from multi seven figure launches down to like one seven figure and then, you know, multiple six figures. And it's because they're doing things the same way that they did 15 years ago. That's not going to work. So you, there has to be more of you, whether it's you doing a and a for your people to answer all of their questions, whether it's you know, jumping on a call for five minutes with somebody to get them over the line, that personal outreach piece. And you don't have to do the personal outreach piece yourself. You can get other people to do it until it's the point that you can, you need to talk to them. But I think that the personal outreach part of a launch has become much, much bigger. And especially for some of the clients that I have that aren't so well known, you know, maybe they've just started and they want to get 20 people on their courses and they've grown their Facebook groups. Personal outreach should be their biggest thing. During a launch, they should be contacting every single person that did the challenge. And there are so many great ways to do this with things like bomb bomb videos and Bajerno and, and all of these kind of things. But they should be contacting them and going, you did really well in the challenge. What are you finding difficult right now? Is this something that I think, you, you know, that you think you might need? What hesitations do you have? What objections do you have? Rather than just hoping that by putting something out there and sitting back because the automation is doing everything that they're going to buy. Um, so it's a real mix for me now in 2020 especially, of automation plus you and the bit, the personal outreach you can give 
plus integrity because I think that third piece is the bit that most people are missing. They just want to sell and that's it. That, people know that now, that you're never going to sell like that anymore. Yeah, and one of the things that we're on about, or I'm on about a lot, is making marketing more human, and it's kind of building the relationships because I think with automation and all the tools that are available to us, people um, have tended to forget that you've got to build a relationship with another human being in order to help them solve their problem, in order to help them, um, well, help them actually buy your product if it's if it's the right product for them. And you can do and, that in bulk. You don't need to do that on a one-to-one -one basis. You can still do it exactly, in bulk, yeah. you know, like doing a challenge. Yeah. It's a great way of doing that. And you can still use the technology, but not, you can, I don't think, you know, I talk about abdicating to the technology versus using it in order to free up your time to do more outreach, like you say. Oh, it's like more. having a child and giving it an iPad while you're doing a bit of work. You can do it for so long, <laughs> but you can't do the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, love it. All right. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating, Lisa. I could go on for ages picking your brain <laughs> about all these things, but I'm just looking at the clock. So I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our, our scripted questions, five questions. It's our innovation round designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with tips from your experience. So you've given us a lot of tips from your experience already, but these ones are kind of like where hopefully will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. Yeah, good. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? I think they need to stop looking at everybody else <laughs> and start thinking about how they would like to do something. And I think we can get real lost in looking at what everyone else is doing and thinking that there's a cookie cutter approach when actually if you just use the things that you're best at and that are your skills to your advantage, you can take a blueprint and properly make it yours. Um, so to be innovative, if everyone else is zigging, zag. Hmm. Love it, yeah. And I like the I, I like what you said about blueprints. So there's there's always ideas you get from other people where you can abstract that into a framework and then build on that framework yourself and, it and develop that blueprint. Framework, doesn't it? Because like, mm. like for me, I just taught you that cash system. But if everyone went right, I'm going to have a Facebook group. I'm going to do it exactly the same way Lisa did it. It wouldn't work because. I have a Facebook group because I love video. If you hated video, that's the wrong way to build an audience. So you have to find the way that you enjoy, whether it's, you know, having an email list, if you like writing or, or having an Instagram pod. And lots of my clients try all these different ways for them. You can take a blueprint so far. You can take a system so far. But you're going to have to adapt it to you. Don't try and become the other person because it won't yeah. work. Love it. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Honestly, the best thing I've done to develop new ideas is ask my audience what they want. Because you can develop all the new ideas you like, but if they don't want it, it doesn't even matter. So if you can just spend time with them, and sometimes that, that doesn't mean a whole Facebook group. It can mean getting five of your absolute ideal clients, and that's why you need to work out who the ideal client is first. If you can get five of those on a focus group, on a Zoom call, and give them all a £20 Amazon voucher and ask them five questions and let them discuss it between themselves, not only will you get the ideas for what you need to provide, you'll get the language that you need to sell it to. Mm. Yeah, I love that, getting the language as well. Mm. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, I kind of almost felt embarrassed to ask that question because I was pretty sure that your answer <laughs> would be that, but there was, there was some extra spice Oh, I there at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So do you have a favorite resource you use most often? I use Asana a lot. Mm -hmm. It kind of runs our life, um, especially now that I have a team. I use that. But if I'm honest, the favorite resource before I had a team was Facebook. And mm -hmm. it's as simple as that. It's, it doesn't have to be anything complicated. I'm still a bit of a paper and pen spreadsheet kind of girl, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, as long as it works for you and spreadsheets uh, exactly. and paper and pen. I mean, I've got, I'm writing paper and pen here right now. Yeah. Um, hmm. Need to be complicated. Business isn't complicated. People make business complicated. Yes, that's right. We get in our own way, don't we? Yeah. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client on track? I found the best way 
it depends if you're doing one to one. If you're doing one to one, you need to be on their backs every week. <laughs> um, but if you're doing things like passive, like I do, then having some kind of accountability pods or some way that they can be in smaller groups where they're heard especially you know i have over 500 people in my courses at any one time so they'll get lost you can't keep someone accountable like that but if you put them in smaller groups of 10 to 20 people even 30 um you can keep your eye on them better and have somebody that is leading that pod that has already done the program so that they can see the times when people are most likely to slip so they can grab them and say, are you okay? Like, why haven't you turned up? Because people need accountability. They need a structure. Mm. Yes, and, and like we said earlier, the, it was the accountability and accessibility that is the thing that really differentiates just an ordinary course from a, a good one and what yeah. helps people get results. So I like the idea of having kind of that small accountability group with a leader who yeah. you know gives some extra accessibility to some access but also i think what it starts with is not necessarily the the things that you put in i think the biggest ways to make people accountable make sure they get results is for you to actually give a damn that they do mm. it starts there um which most people don't have like maybe not most but there's a lot of people out there that don't really care whether they get the results or not and, and they harp on a lot about you know not caring about the results that's not your problem you just need to give the knowledge kind of is your problem if someone's paying you that much money mm. you should do everything you can to give them the results yeah and i think what you just said is is true of pretty well most business is there's, there's those businesses that are just in it to make the money and make the sale but you know after that it, they don't want to know you and you know that could be like i've had some bad experiences recently with internet service providers or phone companies and it's it's the same thing you know once once you're in there they're off chasing new customers and giving special deals to new customers that are better deals than than what an existing customer has yeah um, and they don't really care about the existing customer so i think you know this is not just for membership or course things, but yeah, and and the, secret, the secret, as you say, is to really care about your customer and their success. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, and I think you might have answered this one, but let's ask it again. What's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Actually, I think the number one thing people can do to differentiate themselves is be more them instead of others. And I think that, hmm. If that means you're going to be polarizing, do it. But don't be polarizing for the sake of being polarizing yeah. because you've been told that you ought to be Marmite in business. Just be more you. And if that more you is more vanilla, be more vanilla. You know, it's okay to be whoever you are. Like if you're an introvert, show more of that. If you're somebody that wants to stand up for a certain thing, show more of that. Because if we're honest, people buy from people that they like and that they relate to. They can't relate to you if they don't know what you stand for. I, I talk more about my anti-bullying and integrity work than I do about passive income. People will buy the passive income because they agree with my other things um, and they relate to me about things that have happened to me. So start becoming more open with your audience about what you believe and stop trying. I think a lot of people try to blend in and become the perfect coach. That doesn't exist. So don't try. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of good advice there and we haven't even touched on the bullying thing because I know you've had some bad experiences there. But I think people can go and read about that in some of your blog posts and some of your social media. So where's a good place to... As yeah. well, with about exactly that. Yeah, so where's a good place to find out more about you and where people can reach out and maybe even say thanks for what you shared today? The best place, the place that I hang out in the most is my Facebook group, which is called The Fabulous 5%. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm generally around there. I'm also on Instagram doing, being very me on my story. So if you like a very curated Instagram stories feed, you're not going to get that there. You are going to get me when I'm drunk, when I'm turning the kids off, when I'm on a yacht, you will get the whole thing <laughs> because I don't believe that you should try and curate a pretend real life. Um, and so my Instagram does show that. Um, and right. that's at okay. Lee cool. Coaching. Okay, we'll have links to those in the show notes, of course. Now, um, do you have parting advice for our listener today as we wrap this up? Yeah, I think the, the best piece of advice I could give you is start with how you want your life to look like, 
before you start planning your business and how your business is going to go, because you don't want to fall into having a business that doesn't support the lifestyle that you really want. And I've done this several times now. Um, So now, whenever I speak to a client, it's, what do you want your life to look like? I knew that I wanted a life where I traveled all the time, where I had a lot of freedom, where I could work from anywhere. I only have that now because I chose the right business model to support that. So you get the choice to start there. Hmm. Love it. Great advice. All right. And finally, Lisa, who else should I get on this podcast and have a conversation with? Many people. <laughs> uh, you should talk to Jade Gemma, who does sales differently. Um, she's amazing. She helped me in my journey um, with selling and, and not feeling sleazy about it. Uh, so many people do. You should also speak to Catherine Morgan. She is doing wealth for women very differently right now. She's a real innovator. Honestly, I could give you a list of 100 brilliant people. <laughs> right. Well, we might come back to you on that, although we do have, we do have a long queue, but um, I, always, I always love to have more people than I can talk to in a certain time. Exactly. So I know I've, know I've got these awesome guests like you that come on the show and I have these fabulous conversations with no. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and insights with us today, Lisa. I've really enjoyed this, learned a lot about your model and, um, you know, it's been so inspiring to learn how you've grown that business in, in a fairly short space of time too. So all the best for the future and let's stay in touch. Yeah, thank you. It was really great to, to chat to you. I hope you enjoyed that engaging and informative conversation with Lisa and took something away from her episode. My big takeaway from today's episode is how Lisa has developed a systematic overall approach to her programs based on her own business experience that really help her customers to achieve their goals. I'd love to know what you took away from Lisa's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Lisa Johnson. That is L-I-S-A-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Lisa Johnson. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Lisa, as well as links to her website, her social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in the conversation. Now, if you like this episode, please share it with a couple of other people that you think it would help. Tag me in that share and I'll reach out to you with a special surprise. Lisa suggested that we have a conversation with sales coach and strategist Jade Gemma and with Catherine Morgan, founder of The Money Panel, on future Innova Buzz podcast episodes. So Jade and Catherine... Keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Lisa Johnson. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast, where we've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including Brian McMahon of Expert Dojo and Bob Kulhan of Business Improv. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.